thank you for the introduction and uh, for the invitation. Uh, it's been uh, uh, fun so far. Probably will uh, stay fun. Uh, so uh, the uh, title of this talk is Physics of Wild Sun Metal. It kind of sounds ambitious. Uh, I meant it uh, more ambitious than I think I will be able to uh, to do. But you know, let's keep the title. Okay. So uh, you might have noticed that. Uh, uh, th this field is, is becoming uh, kind of popular, and that, that's because really of uh, experimental progress in the field. So um, what I would like to start with is, the, is to introduce the system, okay, real quick, and then uh, tell you what, uh, what's happening in the field, and then, you know, comment on the uh, aspects of uh, physics of these, uh, of these guys. So what are those uh, Wilson metals? So uh, uh, you have all, of course, uh, have been, you know, uh, abused with, uh, you know, topological insulators, and some have been the the abusers. Okay, and uh, basically, while some metal is the answer to the question whether anything interesting um, happens if you uh, remove the word insulator from the uh, from the title. Okay, so uh, you allow basically a minimal deviation from the concept of an insulator from the full gap in the brilliant zone. You allow to uh, for the, you allow the gap to close uh, at a discrete set of points, and you demand uh, that uh, these band uh, touchings are non-degenerate. I mean, I'll talk about uh, the case where they degenerate briefly. So uh, what you end up with is uh, is there a pointer? I didn't grab a pointer. This one. So I, I press this uh, red button then. Oh, great, thanks. Okay. So you end up uh, with a band structure that looks like this, with, you know, uh, where the uh, conduction and uh, valence band touch at a set of discrete points. And uh, uh, the possibility for such a, a band structure to exist uh, has been known since 1937. Okay. This guy, Cor uh, Conyers Herring, he was a student of uh, Eugene Wigner. So Eugene Wigner did symmetry. Uh, uh, classification of unit atoms molecules. Uh, this guy uh, um, uh, generalized that to uh, band structures. Okay, so he said that this is possible. Okay, so uh, in the 70s there was some work on uh, interaction effects uh, in these band structures, and you know to, to to show that they are not particularly dramatic. And then recently, uh, around 2011, uh, uh, Abinicio people from uh, UC Davis, Juan Sarasov, together with Ashwin Vishwanath's group basically reintroduced uh, this subject into the mainstream, um, noting that uh, such, such states are possible in some, you know, pyrical iridates with certain uh, magnetic order, okay? And they basically added some uh, topological flavor to the story, um, of, and they, they gave full credit to, uh, to Herring, of course, and uh, then the, there followed uh, some proposals from Anton Burkov and Leon Balance uh, regarding uh, where to find these guys in some uh, Heterostructures, and that's how you know the the uh, this new incarnation of the field uh, started. So uh, uh, the, the problem with giving you know uh, credit in this field is that this you know this paper, uh, this paper you know from 2011, uh, according to Google Scholar, has you know 400 something citations. Okay, so things are are going crazy, kinda. Uh, so I, I hope I do not offend. Uh, uh, you know, uh, many people, I probably will offend some people, but I, I don't mean to, okay? So uh, what I would like to uh, mention is, uh, is the theory works first that actually uh, came up with uh, uh, predictions that were experimentally verified. There are many, many, many more theory papers, and uh, I mentioned this, uh, you know, uh, review, or no, not review, actually, paper on classification of this, you know, Dirac uh, phases by Young and Ago, also published in Nature Communications. It, it has actually all the, all the right citations to, you know, uh, to other uh, important theory papers. But uh, what I would uh, say is that uh, while some metals were uh, predi with inversion, uh, in system with inversion breaking was predicted in, uh, in this uh, monophosphite, actually, in these arsenides by you know, Andrei Bernavig and Chinese collaborators. Here, then, you know, there should be, uh, the, the, the fact that there should be a wild cell metal uh, in the iridium pyrochlor uh, was mentioned uh, in that paper that I already uh, talked about. Further, there is some, um, you know, first principle calculation regarding the possibility of Dirac uh, a metal phase that is just really just uh, two copies of this wild cell metal put on top of each other uh, in cadmium arsenide. And, uh, these proposals are actually verified experimentally. 
somehow historically uh, people first found uh, uh, these Dirac semi-metals in cadmium arsenide, in uh, zirconium telluride, and uh, sodium, um, this you know, sodium through bismuth. And finally, recently, recently people started finding uh, pure, so to speak, wild semi-metals, these non-degenerate band touchings, uh, in uh, in uh, various materials with you know broken inversion, and uh, very very recently uh, in the materials with broken time reversal symmetry. Okay, so. Uh, what I mean to, to show is that the, basically there is a strong experimental component now to, to this field. So, and of course that, that what really uh, gives us it uh, gives it uh, its recent boost. Okay. So, uh, why why is all the interest? Okay. So it turns out that uh, these wild semi metals are really uh, gapless uh, topological phases. Okay. So where does that word topological come from? So. First of all, uh, first of all, uh, the uh, uh, the stability of the nodes, uh, the uh, uh, touching points in the brilliant zone, uh, comes from uh, from comes from topology, not from sort of uh, symmetry. So you can contrast that uh, with the case of graphene, where the um, uh, degeneracy between uh, conduction valence band comes actually from the symmetry of the honeycomb lattice. Okay, so here it's not like that. Uh, the stability is, uh, so to speak, geometric. So there are actually there are a few ways to uh, uh, see that. First of all, uh, let's just take a look at the vicinity of this uh, of a single uh, wild node. Uh, near it, the Hamiltonian should look uh, more or less like this, right? Sigma dot p, where sigma is really not spin; it it operates in the uh, in the basis of of those two bands. Okay, it's a two by two problem, so Pauli matrices will uh, come uh, you know come up somehow. So now imagine that I want to perturb this uh, this wild point, so I add some perturbation. This perturbation will look like sigma dot some constant vector. Okay, that's that's the uh, biggest perturbation I can, the largest perturbation I can I can add. Okay, but such a perturbation will just uh, shift the position of the uh, of the wild node, right? It will just shift uh, where I count p from. Okay, because I basically used up all three Pauli matrices. In other words, because there are only three Pauli matrices and I used up all of them, uh, multiplying them by, by the three-dimensional momentum, there is no fourth matrix to end. I can mute with them and open up again. It's impossible to gap it out. You can only move things around until they somehow meet and annihilate. I will talk about why they have to meet. So they meet and annihilate, and this actually tells you that these guys are a phase. Okay, so they, they exist for a range of parameters rather than just for a single, you know, fine-tuned uh, tuned value of parameters. So the same thing uh, uh, can be uh, seen in a different way. Okay, you know that in a two by two problem, uh, the degeneracy point is really a source of Berry flux in the parameter space that is in the K space uh, for these guys. Okay, for the wild semi metals. So uh, the uh, it turns out that then the Berry curvature uh, has monopoles at these uh, at these points. Okay. And its divergence is zero otherwise. So basically, the field lines cannot cannot end. Okay, and brilliant zone uh, is a is a, a complex manifold. So the field lines of uh, uh, cannot cannot just you know go to infinity. So if they started at one monopole, they have to end on the other monopole, which means that you cannot basically kill them separately. You cannot just you know have one of the monopoles disappear because you know Gauss's theorem tells you that you're you're not allowed to do that. Okay, so this is uh, this uh, geometric flavor to the stability of this uh, uh, phase. So uh, normally, when we talk about topological phases, there are uh, surface states that somehow know about the bulk topology. Okay, and uh, these guys uh, also have uh, uh, you know uh, fancy uh, edge states, fancy surface states that are not normally allowed in a in a purely two-dimensional system. So, in a purely two-dimensional system, uh, your Fermi surface has to be has to be closed, right? Because the density inside uh, determines the uh, particle uh, density. Uh, the area inside determines the particle density by Lagrange theorem. Okay. So, this guy uh, does what uh, all other topological, uh, you know, insulators do. Uh, so, remember, you know, uh, quantum hole state basically takes counter-propagating one-dimensional channels puts them on the on the two sides of the sample, giving you chiral one-dimensional uh, state um, uh, states. You know, strong three-dimensional topological takes uh, two Dirac cones in two dimensions, puts them on the two different surfaces. So this guy takes you know closed Fermi surface, breaks it apart, 
and puts you know the, the two pieces on, on you know separate surfaces. So the uh, uh, the edge states here are these Fermi arcs, okay, which again cannot exist uh, uh, in two dimensions. And uh, these Fermi arcs uh, start and end uh, basically at the uh, projection of the bulk while points on the surface in question. And uh, in the case of a uh, two while points, the existence of these Fermi arcs can be uh, very easily understood. Uh, so let me uh, call the uh, axis that goes through the uh, while points uh, to be the z-axis. Then for every, uh, every component of Pz, if Pz is a good number, so Pz is along the surface, okay? Uh, I can think about, uh, uh, about two-dimensional systems, uh, you know, spanned by Px and Py, okay? And they are gapped everywhere uh, away from these two nodes, okay? So I have two uh, two-dimensional gapped systems. They they, they can be either you know uh, trivial insulators or Turing insulators, and uh, clearly at these points the sign of the of the gap uh, uh, is is changed. Okay, so if if they are not inverted here, these two-dimensional systems are inver inverted here, and vice versa. So I know that I mean it, it's a circle, right? It's a brilliant zone, so it's a circle. So either inside or outside these points, uh, my two-dimensional systems are actually quantum hole quantum hole states. Okay. And uh, if, uh, if I have a finite sample, each of these guys has to, ha has to have a corresponding, uh, you know, a chiral edge state going around the sample, okay? So when I, when I take all of them together, they form this Fermi arc on the surface. It, it, it doesn't matter, right? So I'm talking about the spectrum. So uh, how you fill up these states is a, is a different question, right? So it doesn't matter where the uh, chemical potential lies, actually. Uh, it actually, th that's an important question for at least for practical applications. There are models where, you know, chemical potential should be uh, really at wild node, but that's of course not a law of nature. It can be anywhere, really. Okay. Right, right. That that's a, the uh, isoenergetic surface is this, you know. Okay. So, uh, uh, we talked about edge states. Uh, again, uh, in, in this topological uh, phase business, there is usually a response uh, that somehow knows about, uh, about the topology, okay? And again, in this particular case, it's, uh, it's the uh, whole conductivity of the system that is proportional to the distance between the nodes. I told you that, you know, say, between the nodes, every system has E squared over H of whole conductance. So the total uh, conductivity, whole conductivity, will be proportional to the number of two-dimensional systems contained between these two nodes. Of course, that scales with the, you know, uh, K vector uh, that connects them, okay, and nothing else basically. So in a sense, uh, th this is a, this is topological. It doesn't depend on the particular, you know, uh, details of the band structure. It just just you know determined by uh, by the uh, delta K, huh? I mean, it, it it is whatever it is, right? So it no no it, measure it in straight line, okay? But that, that's what it is, right? That by construction. Right, so I I I count how many PZs uh, there is, and you know, I get the distance. Uh, okay. Of course, th this is uh, n not not really a quantized whole conductivity because you don't know the distance between wild points in the first place. But if you can measure it somehow, then you know that sigma xy will be e squared over h times the distance. And we're in three dimensions, so sigma xy has different dimensions from sigma xy in two dimensions. You know, it has one over l in it, and it, it's given by this delta k. So there is another response uh, here that has topological flavor to it. Uh, it's, it's called the uh, so-called uh, chiral anomaly. And uh, I will talk about that uh, in the next couple of slides. But hopefully this uh, convinces you that really we're dealing with a uh, gapless uh, topological system. So now uh, let me give you a, a sort of crash course on uh, chiral anomaly. And uh, it's going to be a you know solid state theorist uh, point of view on on, on this uh, really or you know poor man's approach, uh, better called in uh, in this case. But that's enough for our purposes. So in order to understand what's going on, let us consider a one-dimensional system first. Okay. So all these uh, uh, axial anomalies they happen in odd spatial dimensions. So let's consider a one-dimensional uh, system, the simplest uh, system uh, possible. And uh, it has certain dispersion, okay? And I draw the line, call it chemical potential. 
Okay, and then I choose to uh, to look at low energy physics only. Okay, so I choose a particular window, energy window, uh, at which I will look. Okay, so I am blind to the bottom of the of the band now. Okay, so clearly uh, near the uh, chemical potential, I have two groups of of electrons, the uh, right movers and left movers, and each of these groups is uh, described by respective uh, Dirac equation. Very simple in this case. Minus stands for the right movers, plus for the left movers. They are completely independent. Okay, this, this is a very boring situation, so perhaps I would like to, uh, to apply electric field to my system, okay? So I will apply electric field, right, through the, you know, through vector potential. I will have to make the spatial derivative uh, the long one, okay? So the equation uh, that these guys uh, obey is still, uh, you know, perfectly, are still perfectly independent from each other. Yet, if I compute the physical response to this uh, field, I will see that the, the number of uh, right moving electrons minus uh, the, the time derivative of the number of right movers minus time derivative of the number of left movers actually grows, uh, uh, it is non zero and is given by the electric field that I applied uh, times some you know, universal coefficient that again does not depend on the value of velocity or, or anything else. Okay? So it has this you know, geometric flavor to it. And, and that's actually the essence of the uh, chiral anomaly in this case. In the presence of an electromagnetic field, the separate numbers of these two chiral species uh, are not conserved. Of course, the total number of electrons is conserved. So w when, you, when you do this in, you know, in high energy physics, uh, of course, you, know, you have neutrinos that move in, in uh, you know, uh, four-dimensional space. You don't have bottom of the band. You don't have lattice. Then you ha really have to think. You basically have to either preserve you know, um, gauge invariance or, or the chiral invariance, and somehow experiment tells you that gauge invariance is better. Okay? So you say, okay, I, I will do this. I will break that uh, chiral symmetry, and I will keep gauge symmetry. For us, it's very simple. Electric field just accelerates electrons and pushes them through the bottom of the band from, uh, from, you know, from uh, left to right, essentially. Okay? So the real magic, of course, is that you know, it, this picture survives with interactions and everything. Okay? So this is the chiral uh, anomaly in, in one dimension. So how do we uh, uh, go to three dimensions? Uh, we apply a magnetic field that will confine uh, motion in two of the three dimensions and will, will not affect the motion along the magnetic field. Okay? So, uh, and then you're just dealing with a bunch of uh, you know, one-dimensional problems. Uh, and what's going on here is the following. So uh, remember, uh, the uh, Hamiltonian for a single point that we uh, used was, you know, sigma dot p. Okay, so if I, again, couple it to a magnetic field, uh, the sigma pz, uh, sigma z pz term will be uh, basically unchanged. I'm assuming that magnetic field is along uh, pz. Okay, and the other part of the Hamiltonian will look like graphene in a magnetic field. Okay. And uh, we, we know what the uh, Landau levels are for graphene. There is this famous uh, zero Landau level, okay, and then there are non-zero ones. So um, without PZ, I will have one zero Landau, we'll say, in this, in this uh, valley, and, you know, a bunch of, you know, square root of n relativistic Landau levels. Okay, when I turn on PZ, the non-zero Landau levels will disperse sort of normally, like you would expect them to, but the zero Landau level will, uh, will turn out to be chiral. And then if I go to the other valley, uh, the situation there will be similar, except the chirality, the, uh, the direction of motion of this chiral uh, 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 Landau level will be the opposite. They actually meet somewhere deep in the, uh, in the, the, in the um, dispersion, okay? So deep in the event. So now uh, what happens if I apply electric field uh, along, the, along the magnetic field? All the electrons uh, uh, in these... Uh, in this lowest Landau level, in the uh, sorry, not lowest, the, in the zeroth, zeroth Landau level, will be pushed from one valley to the other. Okay, the guys in the uh, in the non-zero Landau levels, they're also pushed along the dispersion, but they stay in the same valley. Okay, but this this chiral one basically allows electrons to uh, flow from one valley to the other. So I get I get the situation that I saw in one dimensions, except I have one over two pi l b squared density of you know such uh, zero Landau levels. So the, the uh, time derivative uh, of the difference between the two densities is proportional to E times B. Of course, it's E dot B if, if I sort of, you know, do not uh, choose special directions for the magnetic field, okay? So again, we have a similar situation uh, to the one-dimensional case. We have this, you know, applied electromagnetic fields that sit here and then universal coefficient that multiply them to get the, uh, this anomalous divergence.
Okay, and of course this is the instance of, of uh, a 3D axial anomaly, chiral anomaly uh, that would, uh, was discussed long ago by you know Adler, uh, Bell, and Jakiv, and then the uh, this basically uh, solid state discussion was put forward by Nielsen and Ninamiya a little bit later. Okay, okay, wonderful. So fancy systems apparently discovered experimentally. Uh, okay, yes. Um, so b basically, like, why is there no uh, uh, anomaly in graphene, right? So you're, you're missing the third, uh, the third uh, dimension to push electrons through. I mean, that's that's what's in my head, you know, to answer that question. Okay. Uh, okay. So there are, there are problems with these guys. Okay. And if you, uh, I, I didn't uh, put together uh, uh, sort of a analysis of how they, those experiments that I mentioned were, were performed, you, you will see that there are all kinds of um, uh, different you know, uh, ways to establish that something is a wild semi metal or drag semi metal. People use ARPES, some people use magnet resistance. Magnet resistance sometimes work, ARPES doesn't, ARPES works, you know, magnet resistance doesn't. It's sort of, sort of a mess, actually, if you look carefully at those experiments. And uh, it, it, should, it should have an origin uh, in the fact that it's, it's really a you know, it, it's, it's a gapless state, okay? In the topological insulator, you know that bulk is ideally inert, you know, nothing happens there. So you know that you should look at, at the surface and say if you break time reversal the right way, you will localize the surface. You, you know where to look for the response, okay? So this guy is a, is a three-dimensional bulk gapless phase. Uh, in general, the chemical potential is away from these, uh, you know, nodal points. So it will have all the responses that uh, uh, you know, copper with the same broken or preserved symmetry uh, would have, okay? Any response that's allowed by symmetry will be, uh, will be there, okay? So then how do you distinguish this wild semi-metal from, you know, some narrow gap semiconductor? Question, okay? So another, uh, another thing is that, uh, is that uh, again, they are gapless, so they are sensitive to disorder, okay? Disorder will, in general, uh, modify their physics, and... Uh, all these, you know, uh, topological uh, interesting properties uh, will be masked by just mundane, you know, through the transport, some, something very simple, okay? So, uh, I, I meant, basic uh, to uh, uh, comment on, on both of these issues. I think I will be able to go through this, and then I will sort of advertise our work that uh, has to do with the uh, disorder. But let me, let me give you an example of what I mean by, you know, all, all the responses that uh, uh, are here are also uh, uh, in, in other more um, conventional uh, systems. So, of course, uh, once you start talking about wild well, semi-metals, immediately you have to say something about their electrodynamics, okay? That's one of the basic questions. Electrodynamics, you know, optics, uh, uh, transport. So it turns out that uh, if you uh, somehow integrate out the electrons in this uh, wild semi metal, you will get uh, an electromagnetic action, a piece in the electromagnetic action that looks a lot like what you saw in topological insulators and used for their classification, the theta term, E dot B term. Except here, theta will depend on coordinate, uh, in general, will depend on coordinate and time. Okay? So uh, you can take this, uh, you know, uh, this E dot B term. Uh, integrated by parts, and you will see that uh, it, it gets turned in, uh, into the three-dimensional Chern-Simons action. It's a little bit different from the two-dimensional one because you have this additional four-vector, basically because you, you have too many indices in four dimensions. Okay. That's right. That's right. So, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, want, I wanted to kind of avoid that because it's, it's not really important, but so uh, the, um, the dependence of theta on, on spatial coordinates is essentially given by, you know, uh, separation of uh, these uh, nodal points in K space, and uh, the time derivative is given by separation in energy space, okay? Th that's what you need uh, here. You'll see why that, that's actually so. You'll, you'll see why. So, okay, so... No, people say that you know you have this 3D Chern Simons action uh, for these wild semi metals, and then w once you say that, you, you hear noise, and if you listen carefully, you understand that that's Maxwell, you know, spinning in his grave. 
because you know apparently he for forgot something okay for the three dimensional electrodynamics and uh, then you start uh, looking more carefully uh, and uh, one thing that uh, you can do is to look at what kind of current uh, is uh, is uh, given by this by this section okay so the current is uh, is given by this expression i just vary this section with with respect to the vector potential so for the uh, for the spatial uh, gradient, for the spatial derivative of theta, I get a current that looks like this. So here, mu is, uh, is a spatial, uh, uh, rho is spatial. So one of these alpha and beta has to be a time, uh, time, de time derivative, time index, okay? So basically, uh, this, this is current flowing in response to electric field, you know, uh, time derivative of, you know, vector potential. Okay, and you can just see that uh, this is really anomalous whole effect. Okay, so you'll see that it's a current that uh, flows perpendicular to the electric field, and uh, the 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 role of the B field is played by the spatial gradient of theta. And remember, I, I told you it was related to the you know the anomalous whole conductivity is related uh, to the uh, distance in case space between the uh, between the uh, while points. So the spatial gradients of theta are related to the split uh, splitting in the distance between the points in the uh, uh, in the case space but it, it's kind of it's okay it, it's it's not uh, 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 you know it's not unexpected we talked about uh, the fact that these uh, uh, while some metals with two uh, nodal points uh, should have whole effect but let's look at uh, time dependence of the theta so in this case what you get is something like this okay so this is time der derivative of theta and then essentially have a curl you have curl of A, okay? All these indices have to be spatial indices. This is curl of A, so you have a current that, that flows uh, in response to the magnetic field. Hmm. Okay, so current driven uh, by magnetic field is, you know, is something you, you, you know, you know in superconductors, but here, why? Uh, it, actually, it's, it's not a forbidden relation. So first of all, I inversion you know, has to be broken, right? So because you have a... Uh, you have a regular, you know, a polar vector being proportional to an XL vector, so inversion has to be broken. Here, you know, this this is this is this looks like a non-dissipative current because this is time reversal odd, this is time reversal odd, so it's it's allowed even the ground state. So it's it's actually sort of okay looking to you know current, except you know how how do you get current driven by the magnetic field? So, you know, this. Uh, this current has, uh, or the, this, the appearance of current that responds to the magnetic field, you know, uh, has its name, chiral magnetic effect. You know, Anton kind of uh, talked about this picture, about, uh, you know, persistent current in the ground state, which turned out to be wrong, actually. So, after, after uh, it was suggested that there, there is this current, uh, you know, Marcel, Franz, and I think that was his postdoc, uh, basically did just, you know, lattice calculation and showed that there is actually no such current in the ground state. It's, it's, it's perfectly zero, okay? So then, then one realizes that uh, what you should do is really seek response at finite omega and q. That, that's the proper uh, response, okay? And, uh, and there, there should be some, you know, uh, omega and q dependence in the response function. And it turns out that if you send q to zero first, so you uh, look at the uh, response to the uh, magnetic field that oscillates in time but, but is uniform, you actually get something, but it's a, it's a DC transport response, actually. Okay? If you look in the, at, in the opposite uh, order of limits, at the opposite order, order of limits, you send omega to zero first, that static, slightly non uniform magnetic field, you get zero. Okay? So there is no thermodynamic response of this form. Okay? So, but once, once you realize that you are actually uh, at finite frequency, effectively, uh, there is no difference between B and E. Just, just order of limits, uh, really, in the in the Kubo formula. Yes, 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 yes. Just, just the usual, you know, f minus f times the energy difference has to be has to be done properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I, l let me let me uh, comment on that in thirty seconds. Literally thirty seconds. Okay, so. Speaking of action, right? So at this at this uh, moment, you realize that there is no difference between E and B because they are related by Faraday's law, right? Okay, and then uh, you can view uh, this current as res responding to to B field at, at given Q omega, or 
you can view it as a response to the electric field with, the eps with sigma conductivity or epsilon being proportional to Q, okay? which is known as natural optical activity. Okay, so you can rewrite that action just as you know, epsilon e e uh, usual uh, uh, action, except this uh, you know uh, dielectric tensor will have non-trivial uh, omega and q dependence. So the effect itself happens in, in many non-centrosymmetric materials. It, it'll happen in tellurium, right? Many crystals have natural optical activity. What what is special here is really the dependence of the response function on Q and omega. Because of this you know, gaplessness, because of this wild nature of these points, uh, you have this non-commutativity between, between the two limits. So that's special, not, not the phenomenon itself. Okay. Uh, right, so how do you go uh, uh, about this? So again, we're talking about this practical problem about you know, all the responses of these wild and metals being actually completely usual. So what can be unusual? Uh, you can look at the magnitude of the effect, right? It may, maybe it's gigantic in Wildstone metal and very small in, in, in copper, okay? Better yet, uh, you should look at the unusual sign of the effect, okay? So, uh, for example, uh, normally magneto resistance is positive in the uh, classical magneto resistance is positive in metals. Here, it turns out that if you uh, pass car into along the magnetic field, you get some pretty big negative magneto resistance. Purely classical has nothing to do with weak localization, anything like that. Okay, so that would be a good signature. Again, <coughs> uh, you can look at, uh, just like we discussed above, uh, unusual parameter dependence uh, um, of, of things. For example, the optical conductivity uh, in these wild metals uh, for a chemical potential right at the node uh, has this you know, quantum critical form which has nothing to do with quantum criticality. Uh, it will basically be proportional either to temperature or to omega, whichever is bigger, just because there, there is no other uh, energy scale in the problem. Okay? So, but then again, this is, you know, this is the same for very, very small gap and you know, temperature much larger than the gap or uh, literally zero gap. Okay, so... Uh, Basically, I should say that you know this. Uh, so far, th there there are really two types of works. Okay, uh, so either they they show uh, this negative magneto resistance, and they say that that that's really uh, for for the electric field along the magnetic field. Okay, and they say, oh, that's a, a signature of this chiral anomaly, or they you use ARPES to directly look at the spectrum and look at the uh, edge states on the surface on this you know Fermi arcs, which is not trivial because in these materials with the you know bro broken inversion symmetry, this is, this comes from Bob Kava group. Uh, they had to you know look at material that's uh, that's similar but not not a wild semi metal to distinguish this you know tiny Fermi arc on top of a bunch of other you know features. So this is not trivial. So what one wants what one wants is some simple transport uh, uh, signature uh, of these uh, of these wild semi metals and the chiral an uh, chiral anomal uh, anomaly in them. And uh, we will uh, in what I will uh, continue with we will uh, use the uh, uh, non-local um, voltage measurement, basically, to, uh, to detect uh, the chiral anomaly. All right, so this work was done uh, with these, uh, you know, fine gentlemen. Uh, one of them is sitting down there. Okay. And uh, the essence of the work is as follows. So we will use a setup that looks like this. We'll take a, a thin film of, uh, of wild semi metal, uh, uh, which has two sets of leads, okay? So one set of leads is used uh, to pass current uh, in the presence of magnetic field, okay? And the other, uh, the other uh, set of leads is, uh, is a measuring set of leads. It's a voltmeter, and presumably it will uh, measure uh, a long-range uh, non-local voltage that will be strongly dependent on the magnitude and the orientation of applied magnetic fields. So uh, now I will tell you how this thing works. And that should be uh, that should be actually very simple. If if it sounds unclear, that that means I'm I'm doing something wrong. So uh, please uh, stop me. So let's look at the first uh, pair of leads. Okay. So there we pass. Uh, really, we, we're not applying electric field. We pass transport current. It's you know, non-equilibrium stuff is is uh, driven by currents, uh, uh, not electric fields. So we pass a current uh, along magnetic field applied perpendicular to the 
uh, uh, plane of the film. So what do we get? We know that uh, due to this uh, chiral anomaly, the electrons will be pushed from one VLE to the other. Okay, so. Uh, this, this basically acts as a valley battery. It creates a, a given, uh, a given uh, chemical potential difference between uh, you know, electrons with opposite chiralities. Okay? Of course, this pumping process will be stopped by something, either by impurity scattering or by, by the leads themselves. Right? So electrons are blue and, and red only inside this film. Inside the metal, they are all, I don't know, green. So uh, basically, metal... Uh, metal lead uh, acts as a short between the two species. So something will stop this generation. OK, what will happen next? Uh, these guys, which, which I call right just because they're on the right, they, they're actually moving up, it's just a convention. Okay? These guys, because there is a surplus of them, will diffuse outside of this region. Okay? These guys, uh, uh, since there is a lack of them, will, uh, will be sucked in. So what we're doing, we're creating valley current. So this chiral anomaly allows very easily to couple two valleys, and uh, driving currents, we basically create uh, imbalances between the two valleys, and uh, this imbalance will diffuse from outside this uh, this region. Okay, so fine, we created a uh, valley imbalance, we created a uh, valley current, uh, we have to detect it, and the idea here is is very similar to the idea used, say, in measuring. Uh, non-local voltages in, in uh, spin hole effect, we use you know, direct effect uh, to generate something and we use the inverse effect to detect it. So what is the inverse effect here? Uh, it's like this. So direct effect is you know, apply current, apply B field, get the uh, imbalance between valleys. The inverse current is uh, you know, um, if you have imbalance between valleys, you apply magnetic field, you will get current. Okay? So indeed, if something a distribution like this arrives at the other lead and you apply magnetic field, there will be net imbalance between these you know, chiral edge states, and there is a net current that flows, I don't know, say, up. And if it's a voltmeter, it's not allowed, right? Current is not allowed to pass through the system, so there will be a voltage buildup to compensate this current. Okay? And that's the voltage that is measured by, uh, uh, by this voltmeter. As I said, uh, very simple. Okay. And uh, clearly, uh, the... Uh, Magnitude of the voltage will be uh, dependent on the magnitude of this uh, detector magnetic field that you applied and its orientation, actually. If you applied it sideways, you know, in, in the wrong direction, you will get nothing, basically. So this, these voltages will be uh, strongly dependent on the magnitude and orientation of the magnetic field. Okay. So, uh, summary so far. You see that, I, you know, th this is very simple, but hopefully this is... Uh, this is a good kind of simple, you know, th this, uh, this is what uh, will uh, allow it to work. So, uh, what we get is a, is a non-local voltage uh, that basically spreads as far as the uh, valley relaxation uh, uh, length, uh, okay? So, which is just the uh, distance uh, uh, to which electron diffuses before it scatters between, between two valleys. Normally, the, this valley relaxation time uh, can be made uh, large to the uh, in intra-valley intra relaxation time very easily. If the doping is not too large, that's pretty much uh, always the case. Okay, so uh, this voltage clearly depends on the irritation of magnetic fields. Uh, there are a few, you know, um, electrotechnical details. What kind of leads should one employ? It's actually better to use. Uh, tunneling leads uh, that are not too strongly coupled to your system because, as I said, they relax imbalances. Um, you know, how do you apply a B field locally or one big B field globally? Local fields are better because you, you, you just have to separate, you know, uh, knobs to, to tune. Also, there is a, there is a uh, fundamental reason not, not try not to, to minimize the magnetic field here in the middle. Let me actually show you. Uh, so basically, if I apply magnetic field in the middle, uh, I will, and, and I look at a single valley, you see that this extra mode will always run into into a surface, okay? And it, it's unstoppable basically by anything, uh, but a surface, and it, it cannot backscatter because uh, just because of unitarity of scattering, you cannot scatter, you know, two modes back into one, so it has to go somewhere, and of course it has to go into the other valley, okay? So surface perpendicular to magnetic field will 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 uh, act as a you know, valley relaxer here. So it's best to avoid such magnetic field. Of course, there will be fringe magnetic field, which is unavoidable. Okay, 
And you know, the final thing is that you know, detectors can be made non-invasive. You can measure without disturbing what you measure if, if they are not too big. Okay. So, okay, uh, this is the general setup and the conclusion. Uh, I don't know, any, any questions about that? No, okay. So then just one word about how this is actually calculated. So uh, the, the transport theory here is, is very simple. So the hydrodynamic description of this vial semi-metal uh, includes the expression for the current uh, with the usual, uh, you know, through the current that's given by the gradient of electrochemical potential, plus there is actually a, a piece in the current that depends on the uh, chemical potential in that valley without the gradient. That's, that's the contribution for the, from that extra, uh, extra um, mode, right? Even if I equilibrated this valley fully, okay, there is still this, you know, extra unstoppable chiral mode that will carry this current. And this is a little bit disturbing because, you know, you, you know that currents are, should be driven by gradients of like the chemical potentials. And uh, the, way, the way this uh, uh, chemical potential without uh, electric potential uh, issue is fixed is that when you look actually at the continuity equation, right, which involves the, the derivative of this current, it will have this chiral anomaly term in the right-hand uh, right side. And, uh, of course, these, these, you know, the, the divergence of the current will get turned into a gradient of mu, and it will get combined with this E. The coefficients are precisely such that they will get combined into gradient of electrochemical potential. So the physical equation that you get, the continuity equation, actually involves only gradients of electrochemical potentials. Okay? So if you, if you just have a film and you apply an electric field without any, any leads, you, you will not get anything. Okay? So uh, you, need, you need actually currents to flow to uh, get all this physics. Uh, so, my, my, not minor point, important point, but uh, not particularly uh, important for the, uh, this discussion is that you're, you have to supply all this with boundary conditions that are also, you know... Uh, That's, that's, uh, that's essentially what I'm talking about. So, basically, the, f the full problem, uh, l let's think about the contact and, and how to set up a Landau or Butiker uh, problem for it, okay? So, you'll see that, uh, in general, uh, you won't be able to uh, set up a problem, such a problem, for a single valley, okay? Uh, because, uh, basically, uh, there will be... S say it again, I didn't hear the... the Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you're what you're asking. Ah, um, how to say this? So uh, let me let me uh, let me put it this way. So what I'm talking about really is, is the uh, is the presence of the uh, la single landau that runs from one valley to the other because of the of the presence of you know berry monopoles at at these nodal points. Uh, how, how no, Kubo formula Kubo formula will will give you that. Uh, so. How to say this? I'm, I'm not trying to, s to say that it's some sort of magic that, that's not uh, taken by, you know... Oh, that, that's true. That's true. So if, if I calculate... Uh, linear response properly, I, I, will, I will find the, this basically contribution to the current, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I'm not uh, arguing with that. So, yeah, what I'm trying to say is that uh, basically for, the, um, uh, for this contact problem, you have to remember that 
current, uh, the current will be given by the you know, chemical potential mismatch between the R system and the lead, plus you know, this extra contribution from this extra mode that runs into that lead. And uh, yeah, that just you know, have to remember about that. And then um, basically uh, the, uh, the answer for the uh, tunneling leads, uh, for the leads that have uh, much larger um, uh, much smaller conductance than the uh, conductance, the transverse conductance of the film. Basically, the answer looks like this, where beta is, is a certain you know, quantity that has a, uh, dimensions of a conductance and is proportional to the magnetic field. Okay? So that's the answer. And uh, right, so the sign of B terms uh, assume that you know, a B field is, a, is applied either you know, up or down. You just you know, flip this, uh, the uh, uh, direction of the current flow in some coil, but you know if you can, if you can rotate it, there will be of course you know some sine or cosine, some trigonometric function that stays here. Okay, so this ends the uh, the uh, part of the story that that is about detecting chiral anomaly. I have a few more minutes, so I will I will tell you a little bit more about the other part. Uh, any questions about that? Okay. All right, so. Now, uh, let us assume that we found, uh, you know, wild uh, metal using uh, some probe, okay? And uh, what we're trying to answer now is, uh, you know, what's going on with a single node in the presence of disorder, okay? So there are, uh, as I mentioned, there are all these proposals to, uh, uh, to detect the presence of gaplessness uh, through uh, optical measurements. So uh, maybe I should summarize it, right? So if chemical potential is away from the nodal point, we have just the metal. Okay, if it's right at the point, we have you know this uh, quantum critical conductivity. It, it's really easy to understand it. So take you know drew the formula for the conductivity. You know the density of electrons just goes you know uh, temperature cubed. Scattering time is one over temperature because you don't have anything else. You know it's it's electron-electron interaction that uh, provide uh, uh, scattering here. Mass again is non-existent. So take p momentum, some momentum divided by uh, velocity for it, and momentum is roughly temperature again, so you get something linear in temperature, but if, if omega is bigger than temperature, you get omega. So, it's, I mean, I, I cite here papers, you can imagine that derivations are more involved than that, but uh, that, that's pretty much what, it, what, you know, where the answer is coming from. Okay, so the question is, uh, if I disorder it now, uh, what, what will it do to your system? So on one hand, uh, you know, the, the answer is simple. So here the uh, 1 over tau, 1 over disorder time will go as density of state, that is as energy squared, okay? So close to the nodal point, energy will always win, okay? So in, in, in a two-dimensional system, you have competition, right? So en density of state is energy, energy is energy, so you can have, uh, you know, disorder inducing um, uh, infinitely, um, uh, infinitely small disorder, infinitely weak, uh, disorder uh, inducing the finite density of states. But, but here, you know, the question is what happens if you increase somehow the strength of disorder? And the, the common wisdom, which, which we agree with actually, that you know, for a small disorder, uh, nothing particularly interesting happens, but for there is a critical strength of disorder uh, above which there is actually a finite density of states uh, is induced, and then even at, uh, at, the, uh, at the nodal point, you get basically uh, you know, diffusive transport, usual, you know, drew the transport. All these, you know, uh, fancy things are completely masked by actually by, by disorder. So, but what uh, the issue that we would like to address is is, is how to actually do things, uh, you know, uh, for for strong disorder. So, uh, so uh, right. So the, the issue I would like to emphasize is that you know closer to the close to the nodal point, there is this no usual quasi-classical parameter KFL that can be taken large and you know. Uh, um, uh, basically uh, be used uh, to uh, keep track of the uh, smallness or largeness of your diagrams. So uh, one usually either does numerics or use some you know, uncontrolled approximations that uh, you know, are believed to be good enough. Okay, so can we do better? And it turns out that can actually. So uh, as my uh, you know, test disorder, I, I choose a, uh, a bunch of screened impurities Okay, uh, that has e each of them has a potential uh, has a Yukawa type potential, right? With you know e squared over r, e to the minus kappa r. So uh, r, this kappa is one over screening length, of course. Okay, 
So if, uh, if there are many impurities within the screening volume, then I can take this potential to be Gaussian. Uh, and the correlator for this potential, Gaussian potential, looks like this. So uh, there is the uh, overall strength of the disorder and then decay, uh, decay on the scale of uh, screening lengths. It looks more or less like this. Amplitude of fluctuation uh, W and you know, the size of typical fluctuation 1 over kappa. Okay? So importantly, in this problem, there is a large parameter, or you know, inverse of it is a small parameter, uh, the ratio of W to you know, kappa V. So it's 1 over, one over the uh, gas parameter for this uh, system. It e squared over V, just E squared, you know, fine structure constant uh, for, for this system, if, if the screening is taken to be self-consistent. Okay? So uh, I, I should say that if RS is small, then this is a large parameter. That, that's the statement. Okay? If, it's, if it's very large, then, you know. Uh, we, are, uh, we have no luck, okay? So let me uh, see what, I'll uh, show you what's going on here. So now I have to, you know, uh, do some treatment of this disorder. So naturally I want to start with something simple, Born approximation, okay? So uh, uh, how do I evaluate the validity of Born approximation? Take second Born approximation, compare it to the first Born approximation, okay? So I will take the ratio of the self-energies for these two guys, I will see that it's roughly uh, uh, the ratio of you know uh, w squared and you know the bigger of you know uh, kappa v or the energy itself. Okay, so it's small energies or sm you know uh, weak interactions. This is actually large. So at least you have to do self-consistent Born approximation. You have to beyond first Born approximation. But then it turns out that uh, near the node the, uh, the uh, self-consistent Born approximation type of self-energy is the same order as the first interference correction, okay? So th this one is like roughly, you know, half of this one, okay? So really this uh, self-consistent Born is, is, is uncontrolled and, uh, uh, you, you know, what do you do? You do either numerics or you do something interesting, okay? Uh, I mean, numerics is also interesting, but uh, so what you note is that when your uh, Born approximation fails, there is actually another approximation that becomes possible, that is the semi-classical approximation. So here, if you look at the, uh, at the, as the variation of the typical uh, wave, uh, wave, uh, wavelengths of the electron, right? So wavelengths of the electron, the typical one is uh, the, uh, V divided by the typical energy. This is the scale of variation. You'll see that this derivative is actually small, okay? So, so instead of taking your clean system at the reference point for you know perturbative expansion, you can take actually you know Thomas Fermi approximation for your problem as the as the unperturbed problem. Okay, so it's an electron that look goes quasi classically in this you know smooth potential, and then basically this ripples on on top of the smooth potentials are taking into account perturbatively. Okay, that's the idea. So switch uh, switch to a different reference point, different reference point. Okay, so. This, uh, this, you know, the Thomas Fermi approximation itself is very simple, right? So think about Green's function in the in a particular disorder, okay? So uh, normally, you know, p is, a, is an operator, so you cannot just substitute this u with a number, okay? But in in this Thomas Fermi approximation, you you literally take this u as as number that changes in in certain range. It's a Gaussian variable, so you basically take the Green's function and average. Uh, average it over distribution of this of this you know number of this local uh, potential. Okay, so this way, of course, uh, uh, right, and the distribution function of u is just the you know average of the delta function. So it's in the, it's a Gaussian, of course. So density of states basically becomes a uh, you know given by the major new part of this uh, g uh, is given by the this this kind of average of uh, bare density of states calculated not from zero but from u. It's a fluctuating. Uh, electric chem electric uh, chemical potential. Okay, so boom! Immediately you get uh, finite density of states at zero energy, and I should say that this approach, you know, this this kind of treatment of uh, of disorder, goes back you know ages ago. So in the 60s, 60s people did that for disordered semiconductors, and you know a year ago Brian Skinner basically went through this you know scheme. Uh, to 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 find this uh, finite density of states for the uh, for the while uh, semi-metal, okay? But the question is, uh, you know, is, is this a good approximation? What the corrections are and things like that? And it turns out that uh, there can be a uh, diagrammatic technique built to find the regular corrections to this uh, to this quasi-classical result. The idea is very simple. 
So let me take this disorder correlator, okay? I will call it D of R, and uh, separate into this, you know, D of zero and D of R minus D of, it's, it's an identity, okay? So the idea is that to treat this part of the disorder correlator somehow exactly, and treat this guy as a perturbation. So let me explain you uh, what's going on. So forget about this piece now, okay? So we have U of R, uh, correlator of u of r and u, that is just a constant. It's a disorder with infinite range, right? Basically, in a disorder, they are as correlated at zero r as at infinity r, infinite r, okay? In other words, in, if you do, uh, if you do a diagrammatic technique, the usual cross technique uh, for the Green's function here, these, uh, these lines, these order lines, they do not transfer momentum. It's really just a uniform potential uh, in, which, in which electron moves, okay? And this allows actually to sum uh, this series completely, okay? Because it's a combinatorial problem, right? So this this uh, diagram is exactly the same as this one and is exactly the same as this one. All these rainbow diagrams are exactly the same as, you know, crossing diagrams because there's no momentum transfer. Okay, so I just count how many diagrams I have to, to a given order, sum up, you know, some, some series, and actually what I, what I get is I recover this quasi-classical result, okay? And uh, then the question is, uh, how good is this approximation? Intuitively, uh, we can uh, argue that approximation is good is if uh, for typical R involved in the problem, this difference somehow is much smaller than D of zero. Okay, so the typical of R, a typical R is the wavelength that corresponds to typical, you know, fluctuation of the potential. So, you know, uh, basically, you 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 get back to this, you know, square root of uh, RS uh, uh, ratio. So, the the validity of this, you know, validity of this diagrammatic technique is the same as the validity of the quasi-classical approximation of the Thomas Fermi approximation. So, this is kind of consistent. And then, basically. Uh, the point, the, you can show this rigorously, you can do the, the usual, uh, the usual disorder diagrammatic technique, except uh, your uh, bare, uh, bare Green's, uh, Green's function uh, is a Green's function with shifted energy. So you shift it by U, by this you know, uh, smooth part of the potential. And in the end, at the, at the last stage of the uh, calculation, you average over the distribution of U. Other than that, it's just the usual uh, diagrammatic technique for this delta D, okay? So uh, this way, one can easily calculate the cor correction to the density of states, and it's boring, actually. Okay, so uh, but it, it, it's a good boy. So if we found if we have uh, found something, you know, more fun, it, it would have told us that this this you know the, the quasi-classical approximation as the zero approximation is not good. Okay, there is something interesting that happens in higher orders. All right, so. It's actually a good kind of boring that, that gives you peace of mind, okay? So, uh, basically, uh, the, the first, even not self-consistent born, the first born approximation is sufficient for, for this problem, okay? Because you, you somehow reshuffled uh, your perturbation theory, just the first born approximation uh, is sufficient. No, we're we're ex explicitly making it staying, uh, making it stay at the same value. This is just a single valley, single valley problem. No, I mean, uh, my 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 you know self energy is is valley diagonal. I'm not I'm not solving you know. Uh, in, in principle, I should, you know, consider actually disorder scattering between the valleys. But you know, I'm considering smooth disorder, so hopefully it's smooth enough not to scatter between the valleys. So it's just single valley problem. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. So, uh, 
I think it, it's, it's really the three-dimensional nature of the problem. And uh, here, the self-consistent sc uh, uh, screening problem is actually very simple. It, it's much simpler than single impurity problem, okay? So... Um, Charged impurities. So charged impurities uh, screen self-consistently, and uh, this is this is actually what you get for them. Okay. Um, I mean, th this is just the result. But uh, you, how to say this? Um, you you can check uh, whether you know you're doing something right. Uh, you know. Uh, a posteriori, right? So you first, first, you know, you close your eyes and do this, you know, simple procedure, okay? Then you calculate your uh, screening radius, okay? You see that there are a lot of impurities in it, so you, you kind of are, are sure that, uh, that that's, you know, this is the, how to say this? There, there is the self-averaging, basically, to this, to this problem. You know, um, um, So yeah, that's that's what I'm saying, right? So kappa, mm, I didn't put this here. Uh, basically, uh, the real parameter here is the density of, of impurities, okay? So um, uh, kappa is calculated. Uh, I, I can just write down the, the expression for the double. So kappa is, you know, square root over S times W. W is related to a... Uh, to a single uh, impurity potential, there should be concentration in front of it. I'm sorry, okay, and th that's what kappa is. So you find it self-consistently from the self-consistent screening, okay. So this this is really just the semiconductor story, a you know, regular three-dimensional semiconductor story, repeated in this in this setting. That's the that's the point. It it it's it's it's, it's, it's uh, how to self self averaging essentially a problem, which may not be the case in lower dimensions. Um, okay, I, I should. Hey, I'm I'm way over time, so I I'll, I'll stop here. But uh, I, I just want to say that uh, there is you know some picture of transport that comes with with this uh, kind of approach, and actually you can go as far as uh, getting. Uh, negative magnetic resistance for, you know, for RS that is of order of one. Of course, uh, that's exactly where our approximations fail, but, you know, uh, there is an expression that uh, I think uh, attributed to, uh, to Larkin that, you know, good theory works well, uh, well beyond its uh, range of applicability. So if it's any good, uh, you know, uh, it should go all the way up to RS uh, equal to one. Anyways, those are the conclusions. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention.